So are you uh, are you still Big J or are you like medium J now with this diet? What's your weight at? Uh, 241.8 this morning. Okay. All right. Yeah. So that's that's medium J, I think. Although soon to be Big J. I don't... After this show, I think... I find it... All, like, I tell myself I, I don't want to go over like... Well, there's no way I'm going to be less than 225. Because if I'm on stage at 215, like, what, am I only going to put 10 pounds back on after a show? So it's like I must... I must need to lose some muscle or something because I don't want to walk around at 240 pounds, which is what I even like, I'm pretty lean, like visible abs, like serratus right now at 240. And it's like, I don't want to be 240 pounds. Yeah, man, that's big dude for what you do. You know, I was kind of glad when you said that you're like, you know, this is going to be my last show that I want to do. I mean, for what we do hunting and just trying to be active, it's, I've got up to 220 a couple of times. And for me, for my frame, dude, I sucked at hiking. I was breathing hard. My knees hurt. It's just not a good weight for me. So no. 200 or less is perfect for me. I don't know how you did some of those hunts at 270 or whatever you were, man. That's just too much. That's crazy. No, man. It's, it's ridiculous. And the same thing happens every year when I do these winter hunts with the snowshoes. So I've got a torn meniscus in my right knee, which I don't get surgery on. I just kind of like manage it. But I think, especially with snowshoes and heavy packs, like the knee just takes a different kind of pounding. And each time I get back, it'll it'll be screaming. And the only thing that seems to work is I do a big round of BPC-157 and TB-500. And I do those two peptides for like four weeks. And it's a pain because you have to pin BPC three times a day. So you just feel like a pin cushion, man. And it's just like, it's the worst. And you're supposed to get it intramuscular. And it's like, you want me to try and stick a pin in my meniscus? Like, it's terrifying. You're like kind of trying to slide it behind the kneecap and stuff. And it's just like, yeah. Um, Oof, don't sound fun, man. <laughs> no, but I'm, and I'm like, I, I don't, I don't want to have to go to those levels just to like manage performance anymore. I think... I was thinking about it today. I'm going to get back into jujitsu and I think I'm going to go down to lifting three days a week, do like push pull legs, um, and do at least two days of backpack cardio and then maybe like three days a week jujitsu. And I think if I do that and keep my cows in that like 3,500 range, uh, after six months of that, I think I should just be steady at like 220, which for a six foot one dude, I think that's realistic. Yeah, you got bigger legs too. So that's that's the thing. Yeah. The difference in our frames where, you know, 200 is a good weight for me. 220 would be probably good for you're an inch taller and have a little bigger legs. So that'd probably be good. But I'm kind of doing the same thing. I'm starting to add some jujitsu back in and um, I miss it, man. I just, I moved out here where there's no gym within about an hour and a half of me. So I kind of let that be an excuse for the last five years and got out of it. But I just went back a couple of times this week, found a spot. It's a little bit of a drive, but um, felt good to get back in there. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like that three days a week. That's pretty much what I do all summer and fall while I'm out on the boat, man. I've yeah. been doing a lot of that with just dumbbells and bands. And you'd be surprised. You really don't lose muscle. You know, you, you can maintain on, on pretty, you know, two, three days a week, no problem. That's the other thing that I've been going over is like the cost benefit analysis of the amount of additional effort it takes when you get to where we are to actually put on any new size, like oh, yeah. you're killing yourself. Diet has to be perfect. Training has to be perfect. And you're putting, you're talking about putting on ounces every couple months. You know what I mean? But to, but to hold it, dude, you could, you could literally go two days a week, upper body, lower body. Um, and you'd yep. still look good with your shirt off as long as you didn't eat like an asshole. Exactly, dude. Exactly. Yeah. It's a lot easier to maintain, you know, and it's funny because you say that I, I've been doing a lot of nutrition coaching here in the winter, you know, while I'm off the boat and I've been stoked at like most of my clients have been most mainly just like fat loss guys that want to get in yep. shape, teaching them about nutrition. That's, that's a lot easier than when you get a skinny kid that, you know, he sees these 30 day transformations online and thinks like, that's going to happen. And you know, the reality is it's like, dude, that's not, that's not real, man. Like I've trained for 20 years, more than that, 30 years almost to, to look like I do. And, and these, these transformations just, 
it's fake. It's not reality. You know, it's a bunch of drugs and other stuff. And, you know, if you could put on, like you said, two pounds of muscle a year, yeah, you're killing it, dude. You're killing it. I think I might have put on maybe maybe three to f- three. I'm hoping for three to four pounds. Like if I was 209, la- and that's the nice thing about cutting for a contest is I think that's kind of the only way to ever figure out what you've really put on. Yeah. Um, and I was 209 at my lightest last year. I think, I can't remember if that was like the night before or the morning of. One was 209 and one was 212. But the very lightest I was was 209. And I personally still think I had four or five pounds to go to get like legit shredded. So if I could be even the same weight, but like distinctly more conditioned this year, that to me would say I'd put on three or four pounds. But it was like, I was obsessed about it for nine months. Do you know what I mean? Between, and people could, you know, I say that, but there was room for improvement too. Like if you look at how many actual hunting trips I did, most of the guys I know at the gym, they're not doing that shit, man. No, I was going to say, I mean, even me, like, I basically work about eight months on the boat. So I'm at sea for eight months. And then I've got uh, like December through now off and uh, about to get back after it. But in that four months, I mean, I, you know, I plan on, oh yeah, I'm going to go hard and I'm going to put on some muscle. And then, you know, I got my Arizona, I go out there, you plan and, oh yeah, I'm going to go whack a deer with a bow in a week. And then you end up staying out there for three or four weeks, yeah. not touch weight hardly. And you're like, well, now I just went backwards for a month as far as making gains. So now the whole four month process, it's like you finally just get rolling again and then, Oh, it's time to go back to the boat and just hang on for dear life. So yeah, I think that's one of the things that bodybuilding taught me most is that like anything in life, if you truly want to improve requires almost obsessive consistency, like that's, there's no sprints. Like I didn't learn that till my forties, man. Like I'm 44 now. And I think the most important thing I've learned in life is like the only thing that wins on the long term is consistency. Like I always thought there was these hacks or like I was the guy who was going to be smart enough to figure it out quicker than everybody else. And it just doesn't work like that, man. Like if you really want to get good at something, you just have to do it all the time for a really long time. 100%. I mean, there's no secrets. There's no like everybody wants a little secret. And, and it, all it is is just you're only good at what you do. The more you do it, the better you get. If you look at fishing or hunting or weightlifting, I mean, anybody that's like really, really top level, that's almost all they do. And yeah. and yeah. as I like, that are trying to juggle three, four different hobbies. I mean, even me, like, you know, I've been a fisherman my whole life and I was obsessed with bass fishing. And as soon as I got into hunting, um, that kind of took over. I ain't catching as many big bass anymore, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I still catch a couple, but nowhere near like I was. I'm just, you know, you can't, you can't be at the top of everything. Not even close. No, no. That, and that's the whole, that's the, that's the other purpose for calling this my last year to compete is that I just, I know what I love and I love backcountry hunting. And it's something that I'll be able to do into my sixties if I take care of myself properly and the energy and the money and the time that bodybuilding takes away from that is directly impacting my progress as a hunter. And that's the other thing. I think that's what makes hunting so hard to learn is no matter how much you love it, if you're like close to a regular person with a regular life, you actually don't get to do that much of it. Like, it's not like you can just go put in reps like you can at the gym or jujitsu. Like you might legitimately, like what an average dude might go out two or three times a year and that would be good. There's still tons of dude that do one big trip every year and that's all they really get to do. Oh yeah. It's the same thing out on the water fishing. You know how many old timers out on the boat are, they don't want to take advice from a younger guy and they're like, I've been fishing 40 years. And it's like, you don't want to be rude, but you want to say, dude, I fished more in the last six months than you have your entire life, man. So yeah. just let me help you, you know? And it's yeah. same thing with hunting. I mean, I've only been hunting for seven years now, really. This is my seventh year hunting, but I've put in more days, you know, because of my schedule, I'm allowed to uh, go out a lot in the winter. And even though it's not direct scouting or whatever, just even, hunting coyotes or, or hiking these mountains. I hunt a lot of the same mountains, you know, um, for whether I'm hunting coyotes or chucker or anything, dude, just hiking, shed hunting, anything. I hunt a lot of the same ranges that all deer hunt. So it's, it's all info. It's all days in the field. You're learning stuff, you know? So 
you kind of speed up the learning process and, and by getting more days. That's all there is to it. So I want to back up a little bit because, you know, we've been kind of internet bros for a while now. And we've, I've heard like little bits and pieces of your story. And I knew fishing was like a, like a more long-term part than hunting, yeah. but like back up to me for, for childhood. Like, have you always been in California? Is that where you grew up? Yeah. You know, I grew up in Southern California. Um, it's a great place to live if, uh, for fishing, but right. not the best place for hunting. But yeah, man, I, I've, uh, I was lucky. My dad and my uncle got me into fishing at a really, really young age. Fished, you know, was obsessed with it my whole life. And then, uh, actually, played golf in high school and college and gave up a golf scholarship to go work on the boats when I turned 18. So I was getting a little burned out on golf. I was actually a way better golfer in junior golf and high school golf. And then college, I, I don't know what happened, but I started kind of getting into other things and I wasn't playing yeah. as good. So I started working on the boats, um, been working on sport boats for 20 years, been a captain on the boats for over 15 years now. And I love it, man. It's, it's a pretty cool, like I said, it's a cool schedule. I work about eight months of the year, get about four months off. And, um, you know, I can squeeze a couple one week hunts usually if I can get a, someone to cover for me. So right. two, three, two, three good hunts in the fall. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's what I do. So when did, and your old man competed, right? Bodybuilding. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, I think I've told you, but like, yeah, he worked for uh, Flex Gym Equipment. He was the president of Flex Gym Equipment for 25 years, so. I don't know if I knew that, man. That's crazy. Yeah. I've seen pictures. Dude was yoked, man. Yeah, he was, uh, it's funny because he was a cross-country runner as a kid um, and then got into bodybuilding and did that. And then it was funny, through my childhood, like my early, early years, I was going to his bodybuilding shows, watching him compete, and then for some reason he got all into cycling, you know, bike races. And I remember going all his bike races and he went from like 240, 250 to about 180. Like that's boom. crazy. And he got obsessed with that. And then after he had a big crash where he, I think he like hit a big tumbleweed or something one morning, just got really messed up and he's like, ah, I'm over the biking. And then he got all big again. <laughs> that's <laughs> hilarious. That, yeah. So he was president of flex for 25 years. And then the company in tech, for I think two or three years before he passed away. Also, okay. once Flex sold, Flex became Star Trek. They sold it to Star Trek. So, oh yeah, I've seen their leg presses like Star Trek with an AC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. I've seen their leg presses. Yeah, um, yeah. The original, all, all the old Star Trek stuff was Flex gym equipment, and they sold okay. it. So. Gotcha. So when did so you said seven years ago you got into hunting? What was the impetus there? Like, what was what was the inspiration? You know, I mean, aside from like shooting a BB gun at lizards and stuff with my dad as a kid, I didn't hunt at all. And even growing up on the boats fishing, you know, for a living, like, you know how many people were like, oh, dude, you got to try hunting. Like a lot of the fishermen hunt, you know, and I yeah. don't know why, maybe just because I was in Southern California and yeah. um, I just kind of rejected it always. I didn't, I didn't own a gun, nothing. And then uh, met this uh, pretty little hillbilly girl named Kayla. And, uh, and who's now my fiance and she actually, she had to do some convincing, man. Like one of our, you guys have been together for seven years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I didn't know that. One of our first, uh, dates really, when I came out here to visit her, she's like, let's go shoot some guns. And so she was from up North a bit where you are now. Right. Exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah. She grew up out here. Okay. And, um, so she kind of almost like pushed it on me, you know, she was like, let's go shoot some guns. And, and I shot and had fun. And then she's like, why don't you get your hunting license? Let's hunt this year. And it was kind of funny because at first I, I just always had that, like, you know how some people are like, oh, that that's gamey. You don't want to eat that. This food's game. Dude, I don't know if that was just put into my head from people, you know, but yeah, I never wanted to try it. And she, she fed me some venison. I always like pasta and ground beef was like my go-to meal as a kid. Yep. And she made me pasta and ground venison one day. And I said, yep, I'll be getting a hunting license and shooting a deer this year. And that was that, man. At first I was like, uh, okay, maybe I'll get it and just shoot some coyotes or something that I don't have to eat. You know, that was my mentality right. first. <laughs> That's so funny, man. Like now, do you think that is a function of where you grew up? Because so Southern California is kind of you know, super duper blue and kind of like, you know, really liberal and like, like not 
I don't want to say they look down at hunting, but it's certainly they have a different perspective on hunting than a lot of the rest of that kind of Southwest part of the States. Oh, hundred percent, dude. If you, if you went through like some of the towns and cities where I grew up um, and you pulled up your Onyx, you're just like, what the heck? You can't hunt anywhere. And there's all this right. land and there's all plenty of land where you could at least go hunt, hunt coyotes or birds or something. And it's like, city owned or or you know water district owned or some everything is private everything is like off limits so yeah there's just areas big big areas where there is no hunting and so i didn't have any friends that hunted and my dad fished and you know i got obsessed with that but i just never got into it never had anyone that kind of drug me in and so kayla see i think that that thing of not having any friends so I wanted to get into hunting for a year or two, but like, I didn't know anybody that hunted. It was like a little bit like YouTube and podcast stuff had kind of like come into my consciousness. And so it was like kind of bubbling under the system. And then I got hired to be an engineer, a forestry engineer at this forestry company. And the dude I ended up working closest with closest with was like a dedicated hunter. And the funny thing is, I think maybe we've done like two day hunts together. Like we've barely hunted together at all. But just knowing him and being around him and being able to go like, what gun should I get? And how do I go get a license? And just having somebody around to like bounce those ideas off of, like, I think that there's a lot more friction there than you think when you don't have people around you who are like, I think about that sometimes with people who work out, like everybody I know in my life is healthy for the most part. Like I don't really know. Well, I was going to say, I don't know a lot of fat people. I, I do know some fat people, but uh, most of the people who are in direct contact with me on a daily basis are like pretty fit people. So it just seems like a normal thing for me to go and do. And then I think about people who didn't grow up around fitness and have never really, how hard it must be to like, think about what do I actually have to do to go get fit? And I think the same thing is true for hunting. Like I, there's that adage about you're the sum total of the five people you spend the most time with. And I think that goes for the activities that we do too. I think being around people who are into the things we want to get into makes it a lot easier to, to start those activities. Oh yeah. Well, on the, on the other side, what's funny is, well, out here where we live now, um, where Kayla grew up, there's one tiny little gym and it's, you know, like pretty expensive. It's small. It's, you know, can be crowded in the afternoons with high school kids in the morning with elderly people. So it's not real motivating. If I grew up here and my dad wasn't a bodybuilder, I probably wouldn't touch a weight, man. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. And Ayla, I think she had just got a gym membership and was kind of messing around with it when I met her. And uh, she was coming out visiting me down south and I kind of got her more into it and she got obsessed with it. So like, I feel like she got me more into hunting. I got her more into weightlifting. Now she's a personal trainer full time and crushing it, dude. Like that's what she does for a living now. So it's kind of funny. That's hilarious. So yeah. what was her shtick? Like, what did she love to hunt? Like, what, is it mostly deer up there? Was she, a, was she a rifle hunter, archery hunter? Like, what was her deal? A little bit of everything, man. She okay. she actually, her, it's funny because now we met because of bass fishing, right? Like, we okay. both were obsessed with bass fishing. And if you had to put a percentage on it in the beginning, when we met, you know, obviously I was like 90% fishing uh, and, you know, hunting barely sparked my interest and she was probably 60 40 or even 70 30 fishing like she she does love hunting she grew up hunting with her dad but it wasn't as big as fishing for her and i've kind of pushed the hunting more on her now and and now my i'm like 90 10 80 20 i still do the fishing for living but as far as bass fishing man it's it's the lake up here where we live we're kind of in a little valley bowl and it's two hours to get to any other lake. So it's not a lot of options where I was in San Diego. I could drive an hour, any direction or 30 minutes, any direction and have access to 10 different, 12 different lakes. So if one wasn't biting, you know, you go to the other one, some bite earlier in the spring, some bite later. Um, so you always had an option to get on a decent bite. And out here it's like all or nothing. And this place is pretty tough. It's higher elevation. It's colder. So, I mean, it's April right now almost and the water's still 40 degrees. And with all this weather, the, the river's pushing in mud. It's like chocolate milk. It's just, you can't get a bite still. In right. fact, they closed the lake right now because there's so much debris. 
I'll, I'll have to send you a video. There's like just logs floating everywhere. You couldn't even get around in the lake probably because we just hit logs floating, but yeah. So that's kind of, that's kind of. So thing. explain to me the phenomenon of bass fishing because people are obsessed, man. And it, there really seems to be this like meme-ish culture with like the boats and the tournaments and the like, it's yeah. this thing unto itself that seems to me, although each kind of, I was going to say this, like it seems to be unlike other kinds of fishing, but I think each kind of stream of fishing seems to me as an outsider to be just as, as obsessed as the other one. But given that you were in the one particular cult, what, what do you think it is about bass fishing that gets people so hooked? All right. Pardon the pun. So, there's a couple different things there. As far as one thing that I was going to mention is that the two types of fishing I do, which is saltwater offshore fishing and then bass fishing, particular big bass fishing, it's pretty crazy how similar they are to hunting. Um, when you really break okay. it down, when you really break it down, like literally where the bass live and, and the tuna and all this stuff, I mean, you're taking a topo chart. And then you're taking your plotter on the boat and it's the same thing, dude. You're looking at contour lines and everything and right, you know, right. it literally like take the water away and the big bass live in the same place as the big deer. It's right. like they're in those perfect little transitions, you know, not too thick, not too open. There's got to be multiple reasons. It's not like they're just there for no reason. You know, a big bass right. doesn't just live like on a big point for some, you know what I mean? There's got to be like, you know, perfect transition access to deep water. It's almost like a little highway that funnels them in there. Good food, like all kinds of different things, you know, the, the direction that it faces, the way the wind blows into that point. There's so many different reasons, um, that, that bass fishing and, you know, hunting connect. But, um, yeah, as far as it being like, like you said, kind of a cult, that's pretty new, man. It's okay. pretty kind of like hunting. I'm sure you've seen how it's like almost cool yep. to hunt. Oh. Bass fishing, has been, you know, with the internet blown up like big time. It's kind of, it's kind of crazy. And it's same thing for the good and the bad. I mean, you, that's honestly one reason I've leaned into hunting so hard now too, is because, I mean, you can get away from people. You can, I can go, especially out here, there's a lot of public land out here and we don't have the biggest deer. I mean, a couple, three years ago, I killed like 135 inch buck and 162 inch buck those are like the biggest deer anybody's ever seen out here in, in, in this area that I'm from. They're like, and are we talking shit. mule deer or blacktail where you were at? Mule deer. Okay. They say there's like a hybrid mix, but they're pretty much mule deer. Okay. But um, those were big deer for out here. Right. So, yep. you know, in this zone in this area for, for California, 160 inch deer is a pretty freaking big deal. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's, it's just, there's ridges that I can go hike up that nobody else is going to hike up. I've gone up ridges here where I found a hundred plus antlers just laying on a little ridge because I mean, there hadn't been a person on that ridge in 10 years. And I love that dude. I love just going into unexplored stuff. I feel like a little kid again, man, like what's going to be over that bridge. And you know, you're knocking out the fitness with it on top. You're getting in shape. You just, you just feel awesome. But bass fishing is getting, pretty bad out here man that the lakes are small right. in california that's you know if you're in texas or northern some of the lakes up in northern california and the delta and stuff are pretty big um and you can get away but here in southern california man these lakes are they're more like a pond dude and, and some of them even in san diego you get 10 boats on them and it's crowded right so with the popularity and especially the big bass that people want to catch and throw the big swim baits. It's almost like you're just playing musical boats anymore. Like, you know, a small lake might only have five or 10 really good key spots where you have a good chance to catch a big fish. And it's like, you're just taking turns alternating. And it's like, right. Me, that's, it's just not as fun anymore, man. Well, and this, this is probably an ignorant question, but are, are, are these like, is this catch and release fishing or are people eating this fish? Yeah. So bass fishing, I'd say like 90% of people, they just let them go. Um, okay. especially like the tournaments, you actually get like penalized if you kill a fish in a tournament, you know, and you okay. get points, but, um, yeah, bass fishing though, you know, it's, that's changed too over the years. It used to be like, just kill them. Everybody right. used to, kill them. and what's funny is 
there's like a big debate on on whether it would be better to kill them and keep them and eat the bass because what happens now we had bigger bass in all these lakes back in the day and more big bass <clears throat> um and what happens now it seems like anyways the, their growth gets stunted most most bass kind of like you know deer and animals like i'd say you know there's a high percentage of them that are only going to be two to four pounds no matter how old they get right 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 you don't take those ones out that gets too many of those mid-grade fish and those mid-grade fish eat all the bait eat all the food so now you can't grow as many big fish right so, and then on top of it fish get smarter so you catch them and release them they get harder and harder to catch yeah especially the bigger ones so yeah, it's kind of funny. People used to catch a lot more big bass back in the day. And, and I guess like at the, the trade shows and stuff, it was like cool to just have like a cooler where you rip open your cooler and there's a bunch of 10, 12 pounders. And now it's like people will cut your head off if you if you kill the a 10, 12 pounder. You know what I mean? That's so, crazy. Yeah. So give me so give me an idea. What are some of the bigger bass that you've caught? Um, well, I have caught. Like out anywhere, anywhere in the world, a double digit 10 pounder is considered a really big bass. Um, okay. And I'd have to count what I think I've caught right around 15 double digit bass. So okay. those are pretty big ones. Um, not as many in the last few years since I moved out here. I've been out here for five years. And like I said, I've kind of hunting has kind of taken over. I've only caught one double digit bass in the last four or five years or something like that. Um, which was a 12 pounder last year. That was, that's probably my second biggest bass. I've caught, um, my biggest bass, my claim to fame. Only reason I have a decent Instagram following pretty much. I caught a, uh, 16.2 at, uh, Lake Skinner out there in Temecula. So, um, and that was actually, it's the lake record or a controversial lake record because, uh, I caught it like right on the, the line of the, like a buoy line. And anyways, okay. Yeah. So some guys there always threw. seems to be shit like that with fishing, man. Like there's, it's always like, yeah, they're really nitpicky about some, which I get. It's the same way with counting antlers in, in hunting. Do you know, as soon as somebody gets something kind of close to record setting, you know, everybody gets real anal real fast. Oh yeah, for sure. But it's, yeah, that was the biggest one I ever caught there. So that's my biggest bass by far. That's like a bass that I don't know if I'll ever catch one that big, you know, that would be like a 200 inch mule deer. Um, or maybe even more like a 250 mil deer. Ho snap yeah. son. Yeah. It's yeah. It's okay. Big. Okay. Okay. A 200 is like probably like a, probably a 13, a okay. 13, a teener is a big, big bass, but a, a 16 plus a 15 plus is a giant bass. Yeah. 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 That's there crazy. hasn't been a 20 pounder caught like in forever. Pretty much. Okay. There was one in Japan that was like a, a controversial world record. It's funny. Check this out. So a dude from Japan caught the world record, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, something like that. And, uh, I think he beat the U S like the, the long lasting Georgia world record by like 0.1 or 0.2 ounces. And they like made a new rule that said it has to be like 0.3 ounces bigger to be the new world record. So they gave him like a asterisk, like tied for the world record type thing even though it was bigger and the original one was like weight on a freaking like postman scale like you know what i mean so that's just funny how the world works that is crazy man were you yeah. into the tournament scene uh not really i've done some but um doing what i do for work tournaments are always on weekends and weekends right. are busy time so i did like one circuit where you know you do like a i don't know 10 12 tournament series for uh you know, every weekend for a while, one winter and we were actually doing really good. And the dude that I, uh, did the tournaments with, he, his wife, like, I don't know, I cheated on him or something. He had an issue. He just pulled out of the tournament. It was a fucked up deal. So we were literally like in second of all the teams and possibly going to win it. And like, yeah. So that was my, you know, first and last tournament experience <laughs> kind of over it. Like, yeah. 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 You partner drops out. Like, oh, cool. Bummer. So, Talk to me about work a little bit, because I'm, I'm always fascinated with people who work on boats ever since I watched Deadliest Catch. I've wanted to go work on a boat. Um, what what does it actually look like? Like, what are the boat sizes? How long are trips? Like, what's the actual, walk me through what a, like a regular trip would be like. Okay, so I've done a lot of different types of boats. Um, always sport fishing. Okay. Um, Deadliest Catch is commercial fishing. So commercial sure. fishing is where... You, whatever you catch, you sell it to the market 
for your money. And then sport fishing, you take passengers out and they keep right. the fish. Right. So I've always done sport fishing, but, um, I started out doing day trips, like half day, three quarter day trips. Okay. Um, so five hour to eight hour trips, which is pretty cool. Honestly, if I hadn't moved, um, well, I guess I'd already transitioned into longer trips, but at, if I hadn't moved, I think I would have probably gone back to that. It's like, oh, you can have a little more normal lifestyle. You can do yep. what it was double half days. So two, five hour trips a day or three quarter day trips was like, I had a seven to four run. that was like a cakewalk. So you get to go home every night, still get to go yep. to the gym, have a normal life. It's pretty cool. Um, I did that for a while, probably eight years or so. And then started doing multi-day trips. So down from, uh, to San Diego, we do a lot of two and three day trips was the next couple boats that I was on. Yep. Uh, and that's like most of the time, you know, a lot of guys, you, you work three, four, five trips and then you take a trip off type deal. Right. Um, so you're on the boat for a week or 10 days, 15 days, whatever, two weeks on sometimes. And then you get a few days off. Um, and you're usually, we leave out of San Diego. Most of the time we're going down to Mexico fishing offshore. Um, and it's pretty cool, man. I, I ended up after that doing a few long range boats where we did anywhere from seven to 16 day trips. And then I, now I'm kind of back in the, the two to three day trip range. So that's what we're doing now. So, so do you drive back and forth every trip? Or are you like staying down there for a few trips and then come home for three, four days? No. Yeah. I, I stay on the boat. All the, all the boats that are multi-day, you're basically like the boat gets in at 6 PM at night. And leaves at 8 p.m. Like, so you're straight turnaround. Get get the gotcha. people up, get a new group on. Get new food or whatever, like. Restock the groceries, exactly. Get the fish yeah. off, people off, get new guys on and go. And so I do typically right now, uh, two, three weeks on and then take, I don't know, three to five days off is I'd say about average last year what I right. did. Yeah. So, yeah, you're, you're on the boat a while. So you're, you're like I said, I, I got dumbbells and bands and a little trx straps and i just try to get a little pump whenever i can you know but yeah the eating hey. thing's not bad though we got we got pretty badass chefs on most of those boats and right i do uh i don't get to eat as many carbs when i'm out there but usually i just kind of do it's like unlimited meat you try to well i can remember last season dude you were like meat and fruits like that was yeah. it yeah, pretty much when I'm out there, I, I do a little bit of the protein oatmeal and I'll have rice once or twice a week. But yeah, it's 80, 90%. I was just eating meat and fruit and I, I did pretty good on that. I like it. And what kind of fish are you catching? Uh, mostly tuna these days. Bluefin tuna is like the hot thing. It, it That kind of changes year to year. But the last handful of years, we've had um, really good bluefin tuna fishing which has helped how we were talking about fishing blow up bass fishing and, and saltwater fishing that, that, uh, we never used to have bluefin like this. I mean, you would get them on, I'd say like a two or three day trip. You had a chance sometimes during the right peak of the season of getting like a 60 or 80 pound bluefin was a freaking trophy back, back in the day, right. even, even seven, eight years ago, that was a big one. And now they're catching hundred, 200 pounders on a day trip out here. So we've had a big influx of, of bluefin tuna. The water hasn't got cold like it used to in the winter for, for a number of years. And so they're kind of like not leaving. They used to migrate and then come back and they've just been kind of living. They've kind of established their own population, you know, all fish, uh, they kind of like wherever they're born, they kind of return to spawn the next year type thing is okay. what happens. Even bass, like they typically spawn in the same cove every year or whatever. So they kind of are just, we're in our own little cycle of bluefin where they're coming and for a while it was getting crazy, dude, for the first three to five years of this cycle, they were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Like, like I said, like an 80 pounder was a giant back in the day. And then now, you know, five, six years ago, like we're catching hundreds and then the next season, two hundreds and then three hundreds. And then one year there was a few 400 pounders caught. So we're How do you even get a 400 pound fish in a boat, man? <laughs> yeah, we we're getting almost like you got a crane. That's it. No, well, you got to have a bunch of gas. So you have a big bamboo hole with a yep. hook and yeah it takes two three four guys to get one of them big ones over the rail Jesus. yeah but no My i mean go ahead uh, oh i was just gonna say that that was a little bit short-lived as far as them getting bigger and bigger and bigger but now still these last few seasons like catch some 200 pounders and a few bigger than that so pretty good it's been good for 
all the boats, you know, anybody that has a decent operation has been pretty much sold out all summer and fall these last few years with this fishing. It's, it's pretty damn good. And how big are the boats? Like how many, how many clients are you guys taking out at a time? Um, the boat I'm on right now, it's uh, like a 60 foot boat and we take 22 passengers max and we have five crew. So, um, wow, that's a lot of people on a boat, man. Yeah. I mean, the, I've been on some bigger boats. The independence is like one of the biggest boats that that's the one I said did all the way up to 16 day trips. Okay. The, boat, the boat's 35 feet wide. It's a monster, 120 feet long or something. And, and, uh, that that's boat crazy. That boat, I t- think, took up to 35 people. But yeah, I mean, a lot of the boats will take, you know, this, there's a lot of like 80-foot boats, 90-foot boats that do this multi-day stuff, and they'll take up to 35 people. Okay. Uh, and I mean, it is comfortable, too. Obviously, when you get a rip and bite, like you got 35 people all hooked up, it gets a little crazy. There's going to be some tangles. But for the most part, yeah, 20 people, 30 people, it's pretty manageable on those boats, man. And it's comfortable. You know, they got a big galley. You can seat damn near everybody in the galley where you eat dinner and stuff. So that's Sometimes wild. Two sets. And, like, and what's a trip like this cost for somebody who wants to go fishing for, they're going to go out for like one of these two, three day deals. Fishing is getting expensive, dude. Fishing is getting expensive. The boat that I'm on now is all private charters, which is pretty okay. cool. We will, um, it just changed owners last year. So we did do a few open party, um, trips where that's where like you can just sell tickets and any random guy can get an open party ticket. Okay. Private charters were like a business or a group of friends charters the boat, right? So there's okay. a set price on the charter. They can buy the boat, rent the boat for, you know, the two or three day trip and bring as many people as they want. They can bring two people, they can bring 10 people, they can bring 22 people. So okay. um, the same price. So yeah, the open party stuff though now, man, it's getting upwards for what what a popular trip is that a lot of people like to do is the day and a half trip, right? Because okay. you can basically leave in the evening. You could only like take one day off work if you wanted. You could leave in the evening, yep. you fish all day the next day, and then you get in the next morning. So that's a day and a half. And those are like 500 bucks now pretty much without even uh, – That doesn't seem bad, man. Yeah, it's not – I mean – they, like an overnight trip used to be like 99 bucks, you know? So, right. Okay. So okay. Just over the year, it's going up and up, you know, fuel's going up. Everything's sure. getting so expensive. Yeah. Um, I can't even imagine how much fuel you'd, you'd burn because that yeah. whole, you're like that, the whole nighttime to the morning part is you just like burning to get to wherever you're going to go fish. I'm assuming. Yeah. These boats aren't real fast. They cruise most of them around 10 knots, but still you burn a lot of fuel, man. That's. Oh yeah. Biggest cost for the, you know, for these boats is the fuel and then the bait, you know, the bait company to supply us with live bait gets a big chunk of the, the money too. So, right. Yeah. And what are you I using actually, for bait, for live bait? Uh, live sardines most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those real big, big uh, tuna uh, were caught at, at night. You know, we do the night fishing with like jigs. Um, okay. Which is, can be fun. It can be a nightmare sometimes when you're on a trip lately these that used to never be a thing that's what's funny too is i mean even five years ago we never fished at night like hmm. almost never there was nothing to catch you couldn't catch them and and it, everybody wonders now it's like were these things biting at night the whole time and we just never fished for them because these blue and i mean a lot of them are being caught at night if they don't bite in the day it's almost like okay it's game time they're gonna bite tonight and and it's when we've been catching a lot of the big ones so yeah, my only real fishing experience, like I did a little bit of river stuff when I was a kid and a little bit of like, you know, tinny lake stuff with my grandpa, but you know, nothing that I really remember much. And then when I ran a crew on, do you know what Haida Gwaii is or the Queen Charlotte Islands off the coast of BC? So basically you go all the way up the coast of British Columbia. The Alaskan panhandle comes down really far, it, like past the Yukon, like really far almost the top third or quarter of British Columbia. And you, you basically go three quarters of the way up British Columbia. And then off the coast, there's these islands that used to be called the Queen Charlotte Islands. But then for you know political correctness, um, they're actually a world UNESCO heritage site uh, because they didn't have first contact until like 120 years ago, which is not... It's not that they didn't have first contact, but it, it it's like the society and culture was left intact until 120 years ago. Like, I think it was that Captain Scott guy that went over there. Anyways, it's these two islands, the South Island and the North Island, that's Haida Gwaii. Um, 
and there's a bunch of forestry that takes place over there, and there's a shit ton of fishing lodges on the west coast of Haida Gwaii. And so when I was running operations up there for two years, every summer, that's what we would do for this staff party, is I would get a couple boats, and we would go fishing. And they got... They got everything. Like you would, you could, you could do salmon fishing out the back if you wanted to, or you could, you could jig for halibut and cod and all the rest of it. My buddy sent me a box of fish down. I bet you I've got like eight or nine different kinds of fish in there. There's like rockfish, snapper, uh, lingcod, halibut, a uh, couple different kinds of salmon. And I, like it would be crazy. Like you'd go out with like, we'd go out with two boats, maybe four or five guys on each boat, much smaller boats. And, um, but you would catch way more. And I think the charters, like I was getting a good deal cause it was like bro pricing, but it was like 12 or 1500 bucks for the day. And that would cover everything. And we were probably catching like two grand worth of fish. Like you were going home with more fish than what you, like I can remember flying home with like a set, like, a cooler that had 75 pounds and this is like 25, 30, $35 a pound fish. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was crazy, super fun. You kind of feel pukey the first half of the day. You know what I mean? Like, cause you're not used to being out there, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the sum total of fishing I've done. I got a little backcountry set up for this year, but I still don't know what the fuck I'm doing, man. Like I got the, the rod and like a couple of little bits and bobs, but um, I'm always sheep hunting around these like lakes and everybody's like, oh, you should be fishing. You know what I mean? And so that's kind of like my challenge to myself this year is to try and catch some fish while in the back country, maybe spruce up the menu a little bit. So it's all not just freeze dried shit. Yeah, dude, that's rad. I, I actually, I usually hunt the desert around here, uh, for deer, but this year I did a, uh, like a high country hunt solo. My first, that was actually like my first, like think that is like my first like actual pack you weigh in and um do that for archery season this year and there was a couple creeks up there at eleven thousand feet that had you know these little trout that were like this but i, I could almost caught them with my hands and i was like thinking like oh dude yeah. it's funny almost if i'm actually glad i probably wouldn't have got a deer I, i'm glad i didn't have a pole i'm gonna get one this year and bring it <laughs> next time but i i got like that that evening that i killed my buck i um it was when I found all these trout and I was kind of messing with them for five or 10 minutes. And, you know, luckily I didn't have a pole and I probably would have. And I ended up finding that buck like right before dark and got him killed with the bow. So probably would have cost me a deer if I would have started messing around with fishing, dude. That's, that's <laughs> hilarious. Um, yeah, man, I, uh, yeah, I want to challenge myself to do that this year because I think it'd be something cool. And there's always like downtime, like you're waiting for the plane to come or the first night when you get dropped off, shit like that. Um, and it's always good to learn how to do new stuff anyways. Yeah. So right now, would you say archery deer hunting is your biggest passion as far as hunting goes? Shit, I'd rather shoot them with a gun if I get Would you tap. really? I mean, I, I love them both, dude, but I mean... Yeah, it's, you know, archery's frustrating, man. I've, I've been yeah, on some in Arizona and just, you know, being new. The first couple of years I went out there, I was on some giant deer, dude, and, and we didn't have radios or nothing. I was inside 100 yards on, like, this legit 200-inch typical, like, three times, totally bogeyed it. Like, I was 55 yards waiting for him to clear one tree and you know like stepped up like i was already like down waiting to draw and i kind of like my knees i was down on my knees and got uncomfortable and had to like shift my foot and one little lava rock shifted and the doe kind of turned and started to stampede man otherwise that buck was gonna get it dude it was just an unbelievable deer and <clears throat> yeah i mean i've been on some stocks where oof, some good deer you know it's just it's hard to get them killed you know that arizona country the hardest part is getting a shot there's it's so thick out there you yeah. think it and when open. you're down in it like i don't think most people understand how big a part of the game radios are down there and i oh, still yeah. think that's somewhat controversial like i remember somebody I, I posted that video of my big mule deer and somebody like oh i can't believe you're using a radio and i'm like bro do you have any idea what this is like like you don't even know where any, like you're just covered in like oak and mesquite and it's like, you're in this flat, you see nothing. Like 
my hat's my hat's off to like if you can go down there solo in the flats and kill something without a radio I would love to try it someday but like that is like a whole other level of of skill down there because I like when I killed that mule deal I absolutely had a dude up on a hill in my ear you know what I mean like walking oh. me into it you literally have to hunt different if you're gonna hunt solo yeah. out there you have to almost like cut yourself down and hunt smaller. You almost have to be on like little tiny knobs and hope that the deer are pushed yeah. up higher. Because when you're up high on one of those deals and you drop in on a deer, you're lost. If you don't have someone to radio you in there, nine times out of 10, you won't even find the freaking nope. deer. Like nope. you won't. I, I was uh, talking to somebody, I guess the new, um, were they Swaros? I don't know. Some of the new binos actually have like a, a feature where you can, range find it and it'll put a pin in your phone and that would be pretty badass for some of that stuff. I've always wanted something like that. Cause I was thinking of that on Onyx Cause you're always trying to like walk somebody in on glassing. And I'm like, oh. why can't I just touch the fucking screen? And this just shows up on their screen. Like this is ridiculous. Like, no, that's <laughs> where the deer is. Yeah. That would be amazing. Cause the one thing I've started doing is taking pictures so yeah. if I'm like, I'm looking at the hill and like, I know where something is, I take a picture, I draw a little red circle around it. I put it in my phone and then I'll get up and move because otherwise you move two, three, 400 yards, you get a different angle of the hill and like the rocks, not where the rock was and the trees aren't where the trees were. And it's like, you have no point of reference anymore. Oh dude, I've walked my chicken on, on so many deer that like, you know, it's even, even there people think it's, oh, it's easy. You're walking them in. Dude, I've got her to where she could like throw her arrow at the deer and she still can't see the deer. Like yeah. that's been our biggest problem with her out there is, and it might be me screwing up, but like I get her right on top of these deer. She's probably been on t at least 20, 30 stocks where she's inside 30 yards and she's still just like, I don't know where the deer is. Like, yeah. where's this deer? And then all of a sudden it's like, I think she's 60 or 80 yards a lot of times or a hundred yards, you know, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it, you. Know it's hard ways. to judge distance there too. And my thing is like, there's actually a point you cross when you're too close. Like I think that 40 to 60 is golden. As soon as you cross that 40 line, you're fucked, man. Like if you don't see that deer in 10 to 15 seconds and pull a shot, you're going to get a little swirl. He's going to pick uh -huh. up something weird and it's game over. Cause that's what's happened to me. Every time I've gone coos deer hunting, I have gotten close and literally had the guy screaming in my ear like, he's right fucking there. And I'm like, bro, I, I, I'm telling you, I'm not yeah. a moron. I can't see the deer. And then just pop, he poofs up out of nowhere and he's like in the next county. And you're just like, yeah, yeah man, it's a whole inside. different animal. In Like it's a whole different style of hunting. It's one of my favorite styles of hunting. And it's funny because I know I'm known for the backcountry stuff, but like, if you live in a place like even where you're at or like down in Tucson, the fact that you can just get your truck in the morning and almost go have like the best parts of a backcountry hunt for the day and then just go sleep in your own bed at night. Like there's nobody out in those hills. You'll see the odd like vehicle driving around and stuff, but you can have some really cool, like pretty remote adventures, like not even that far away from places. It's crazy. Oh yeah. That's the only thing, man, that this year, it was kind of a bummer, dude, is that, a lot of the units now that they put the new quota system and all that stuff, dude, a lot of right. the units that we wanted to hunt were closed. Mm. Um, we didn't even get to hunt because it would be fine if they did that and they started it in January, but they're starting it in August and December for the okay. season. So come January, like, like I killed the deer last January. So now this January, they started the season in December. So where I wanted to hunt was already closed where I killed my deer last year, already closed. So I didn't even get to hunt it. And then what it's doing is basically just creating a big chap traffic jam because now well, it concentrates the pressure on the open units. As soon as these units close, everyone's going to the next one closest and the next one. And then it's like, oh, dude, like I was I got frustrated. My chick, she she's good at keeping her head in the game. Yeah, I not good at both fishing and hunting at, at, with like hunting around people, dude. I mean, I need to work on it because that's a part of it. But yeah. Dude, I'm just like, get me out of here. My, I had one good stock this year. Dude, we were out there for a long time too, like like a long time. Because we hunted. She didn't get one in uh, last year, so we hunted like the last week of December for her. Okay. And then we were out there in January. and I had one good stock on a buck, and I should have took the shot. It was like 50 yards through an Ocotillo, and I was waiting for him to clear it, and we had to stare off. And 
I wish I just sent it. I mean, the Ocotillo is 90% air, but it was my yeah. first time the whole trip. And I'm thinking like, no, you don't want to start this off with wounding one or, or hitting that Ocotillo. Just wait, yeah. just wait. And he bounced. But then uh, the only other stock I got, it was like, we found this giant three point, like a 28, 29 inch three point. that was yeah. probably a 70 inch, 180 inch three point, huge, huge three pointer. And, um, the evening before he kind of fed up over this deal and chased these does. So we knew where he was hanging out. We knew where he went. And then the next morning, some dudes literally beat us to that knob by like 30. They pulled in and we were cool. We talked to them. They were super cool dudes. And we were like, all right, we'll go over across to there, you know, a couple miles over. Right. And, uh, so we bailed and sure enough, that bucks in the same spot with the same does. And we watched and we watched the dude go in. So we're like, all right, we're going to play backup. So we sent my chick around where that deer pushed those does the other day. We're like, he's either going to go up there or that dude's going to bump them. They're going to go up there and this is going to work out perfect. Well, he bumped them. The does went up there. The deer broke off and went the other way. So then I go and I cut the thing off. I was sitting absolutely perfect. The deer was coming to me on a string. This dude had bumped it twice and he just kept coming like the fucking Terminator. And I think his spotter saw me over there and said, you better go. He, that deer's going right to that guy. And I see the guy like 400 yards just start running and he blew the deer out. And I was, I mean, the deer was coming to me on a string. I was like in the absolute primo spot thing would have came 40 yards. Right. So I didn't have a real good experience out there this year. I was pretty yeah. bummed. I was pretty bummed, man. That, I was really looking forward to that hunt, but. Oh, well, I Didn't still you go got to Idaho t- this year too. I can go back in December. At least that's the cool part. But what'd you say? Yeah. Didn't you get up to Idaho this year too? I did. I did. Idaho was, it was cool, man. That's, this is the first year I've hunted anything besides California and, and Arizona. I've okay. hunted those two states. We got Idaho tags this year, me and my chick. And we went out there. She killed a, a decent old three pointer, like second or third day third day of the hunt probably we weren't seeing you know deer like we thought like we went two days and like literally what were you guys doing like a travel trailer type of setup or or camping or like yeah yeah we bought a travel trailer last year and we used that for some of our hunts it's pretty i think that's a great way to go man like i'm i i love that idea like still get out there and you still wake up and go hunt but you've got like a little bit of the kind of creature comforts Oh yeah. We had, you know, showers and cooking yeah. venison pasta every night, dude. It was, it was awesome. I mean, before in Arizona, we were able to like camp, like we do like four or five days camping and then we'd go get a hotel. Yep. Totally. You just get burnt out too fast, man. Yeah. It's, it's tough, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and unless you want to just get a hotel or an Airbnb for two weeks, you know, it gets expensive. It's, so it gets super expensive. Cause other than that, those hunts are cheap, man. You got mm-hmm. like maybe a $250, $300 out of state tag and like some fuel and food. Other than that, man, like you're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. So the, so the Idaho thing, she got a buck. I was kind of holding out, didn't get one. Uh, and we had to come back for some of our, we didn't have to, but we had California hunts I and mean, we won. And then I ended up kind of getting just too, too many hunts in the same little period there. You know, I went back, I got, got my fall Cali buck, but it was weird because we both had the same tag. So now we're at a point where like, I wanted to go back to Idaho, but she still had her California tag. Right. So, Cause she'd killed in Idaho and you'd killed in Cali. Yeah. Right. So, so we just, so then we ended up going back to Idaho and then I find this buck one evening that I thought was a lot bigger and it was tiny and you know, my ground shrinkage. Yeah, well, in my whole mind, I'm thinking, like, if I just whack this buck, then we can go back and she can get another yeah, Cali. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so we did that, but it, it was a smaller buck than I wanted. And plus, there was there was gnarly snow coming the next day and getting up. Idaho can get rough, man. I've never hunted in Idaho, but Idaho is one of the places that's closest to where I live. Just real big country, real nasty weather, can be real nasty terrain. Like, a lot of yeah. stuff can happen really fast in Idaho. Yeah. I'd never dealt with the, the weather. And it's funny yeah. cause like you talk about mental toughness and I got respect for some of these guys after doing even just that hunt. It's like, you know, where we have a trailer and comfort and all this stuff and it wasn't even that cold, but just, you know, some of these guys like, um, like, uh, Yates, you know, that do that Wasatch yeah. front and, and dude, he was telling me like, 
I forget the temp, you know, negative temps and stuff. Sometimes going up there every morning, yeah. 12 mile hikes and stuff. I mean, you got to have your boots and your layering system has to be so freaking perfect or you're going to be like in a dangerous situation, dude. Like yeah. even that, that little buck I killed in Idaho killed it right before dark. And then I'm, you know, dude, if you straight line it, I was only two miles from the truck probably, but you can't, I couldn't get the truck anywhere over there. I got to pack it out. By the time I've done, you know, cutting it up, deboning it, my toes have been in the snow the whole time. They're, they're about freaking, you know, done. I, lucky I had good boots. And then packing it out, same deal. I mean, if, if I didn't have like good boots, I could have got frostbite. You know what I mean? Yeah. It took, it was on, like I said, it was only a couple of miles, but it was like down and up three or four canyons. It was still like a two, two and a half hour pack out, dude, to get two miles, you know? Yeah. And in the dark and in the, you know, so some of those hunts, yeah, you got to be pretty prepared, dude. It might sound like nothing, but you know, if you're, if you're not like, I feel like I'm, you know, in shape, I feel like I could out hike, you know, 90% of people and all that stuff. And I've got pretty dang good gear. And like I said, I was almost like at the point where I'm like, dude, if my, you know, clothes weren't dialed and my, you know, backpack wasn't dialed and like, dude, I could get in trouble out here pretty easily, you know? Yeah, man, weather takes things to a whole new level. And you know, kind of like deep winter hunts is kind of becoming my my weird passion. Like, it's the same thing out there, man. Like, it's minus five, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And it's like, everything becomes a game of like, moisture management, hydration management. Like, it's just everything is taken to the next level because you're, the forgiveness is just gone. Like, that's why I like going hunting in the Southwest. Like, what, am I going to get a sunburn? You know, yeah. like, like what? Yeah. Like, just make sure you got enough water. Do you know what I mean? Like, and if you're not an idiot, you're not going to get lost. Like it's fun. But as soon as you add, that's why I think my true competitive advantage comes from 15 years as a forestry engineer. Like we worked in the mountains of British Columbia and when, and you know what it's like on a boat. Like, because now being on a boat to you is a job. So the stuff that other people see as like a big deal is just the normal shit you deal with on a day. Like, I'm sure waves don't stress you out. Like, you just go with the flow. And so like weather and mountains, I've seen so much garbage. And it was like, I don't even have to be on some epic backcountry trip. This is just my fucking day job. Like, I'm getting 25 bucks an hour to hump around in this shit. And then you do that for so many years. Um it just kind of loses its intimidation factor. And I also think you, that you need to learn how to behave in those environments. Like I notice some people stop moving when it starts getting cold and it's like, you got to keep moving, man. Like you can't, now is not the time to sit down. Um, and just how you treat like being wet is okay. As long as you can keep yourself warm. And like, there's just a bunch of little rules that I probably even take them all for granted now. You know what I mean? But yeah, so, weather is a, the great equalizer, man. It will, it will make boys out of men real fast. Oh dude. I know. I, I mentioned the other day to you how I'm jealous. You got so many cool options to hunt out there, but I'm not <laughs> jealous of that weather. Dude. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, it's true. I'm excited this year, man. I've got some like legitimately cool stuff on the horizon. And one of the big pushes for me this year was mentorship. Like, again, going back to kind of what we started talking about at the beginning, like I always thought I was a guy who was like smart enough to figure out the shortcuts and didn't need help. And I always viewed it as cheating. Like I thought if somebody else taught me how to do it, it kind of took something away from the achievement. And then, you know, just after so many years and so much struggle, and I've had some decent wins, like, don't get me wrong. I've taken some, I'm very, you know, satisfied and proud of, of some of the kills I've been able to notch on my belt solo and otherwise. But I noticed that like not having people in my life who are significantly better at this than I am and spending a lot of time with those people is like, it's a failure. It's a weakness. It's not a strength. And I got a couple hunts lined up this year, both with dudes who are like legit killers, like way better than me. And they're both, they're super excited to go hunting. Um, and that's probably what I'm most, I usually get most excited about my big solo trips and I'm not this year. I'm most excited about spending time with these dudes and having the opportunity to learn from other people. Let me pause you really quick. This stupid robot vacuum is turned on. <laughs> no worries, bro. All right. I had to put him back in the dock. That's there. hilarious. Dude, you, you know what? 
Go ahead. What's funny you say that is, um, I don't know if I ever told you this. Like when I, the, I first saw like your first video of that Arizona buck you killed, uh, on rock slide. And I'll be the first to admit dude. Like at the time I was kind of like, Oh yeah. He went with a guide and this and that. And yep. like after, you know, doing it so many years and stuff, it's like, it's really no different. The guide was doing exactly what my chick does, putting him in on the thing. And, and the only thing it shortens is the, you know, the scouting, the finding the, the deer, but hundred percent, you live in a different place. I mean, it's almost just smart. And, you know, over the years I've become friends with some, some dudes that are pretty high up and a lot of them, I mean, you know, kill big animals and stuff like that. And just, you get to know people and that's a big part of hunting. You know, a lot of these yeah. guys, even like the Jason Carters and the Marlin Holdens and stuff like, yeah, they're badass hunters, but they have some help there, you know, whether it's, um, you know, getting a, a better tag or whether it's, you know, knowing people that, or whatever, you know, they, obviously they had to start somewhere and they got to a certain level on their own and that's why they've, you know, gotten to the top. But once you get there, I mean, to kill multiple big deer and stuff like that every year, like there's, there's not enough time in anybody's life, even if it is your job to go out there and find three or four big deer, you know, in different States and kill them. Like you're, you're having help, you know what yeah. I mean? All there is to it. Like, whether oh, you're a hundred percent, man, landowner yeah. tags or whatever it may be, dude, it's, you know, and, and the well, even drawing a good tag, like when I yeah. drew unit 36 in New Mexico, like I've never been any place like that in my life. Like, yeah. bro, I could hear bugling 18 hours a day. I was seeing 50 to 75 elk, 15 to 20 bulls. Like it was like my mind now I didn't, now you can get that same tag for like 12 grand or you can pay the $20 application fee and win the fucking lottery. Is there really, I do, I, I don't know in my head. It's weird. I feel, I, I feel like it's a little bit more authentic when you kind of get it the, the hard way maybe. But at the end of the day, I think that's all just psychological bullshit. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. you were still in a hyper premium unit, you know, and and it was the same thing with guided hunts for me too. Like I've tried a couple different guided hunts and I realized very quickly there still needs to be a level of challenge that's going to get me excited. Yeah. And when you, I think any archery hunt guided or not is incredibly difficult. I've even gone on a, a, a guided tree stand hunt. Now I used to think those were gimme hunts. I will shut my mouth and eat my words. Mm -hmm. Like after sitting 30 feet up on that poplar and wanting to shit myself and like making the tiniest little movements and having deer blow out from like 50 and 75 feet away. I'm like, I take it all back. I don't care if you're guided on those hunts or not. If you have a bow in your hand, like I, you have my, my respect. The, the, some of the, like I might take some flack for this, but like some of the rifle stuff where they're like, you know, going out and glassing beforehand and you're kind of just showing up and shooting something at 800 yards. I, I'm not going to talk down about anybody else, but for me, that doesn't get the juices flowing. Like I don't feel, you know, excited about that at the end of the day, but I will also say everybody's line is different and everybody's kind of level of, of comfort is different. And as long as it's getting you excited in whatever way it's supposed to. And, and you're being challenged based on like, I look at like some of these rich dudes who go on the guided sheep hunts and I'm, and then they're like, they're all proud. And I'm like, bro, do you know what I mean? Like this guy carried half your food. Do you know what I mean? You're paying 70 grand. They flew you in a helicopter. Like, <laughs> but it's like, I don't fucking care. Did you have fun, man? Do you know what I mean? Like you enjoyed yourself. You feel like you had a blast. I, I'm kind of over getting bent out of shape about it. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude, like every single cover story on, on the big giant deer, when you read them, you're like, you know, most of them are like, they're at the Arizona Strip and the guides put them on the water hole and then the other guy found the deer. And so he went and picked them up and they were on their way to go shoot the 250, but oh, a 230 walked across the road and he opened yep. the door and smoked it. Like that's pretty much how a lot of those stories go, you know, but hey, can you hate on it? Like, I hope I get a couple hunts like that when I'm 70 or 60 or whatever. And I can't hike up the big ass ridge anymore, but totally, man. Did you ever I see that Jimmy John's hunt in Arizona with uh, Ryan DC? I don't think so. You, you should look up these like string of YouTube videos later. Cause it's hilarious because 
I think it was the Jimmy John's guy. He's like a famous, loves hunting, buys these like insane guided hunts. And I think he bought the, was it Nevada or Arizona? It was one of those. And it was like the Silver State tag or whatever. Like I think he paid a couple hundred grand and it was this elk tag. You got all year, any unit. And it was uh, A3 Outfitter. So it must've been Arizona. Yeah. I think they had upwards of like 20 guides. Yeah. Um, out scouting for this elk for months. Like this dude dropped hundreds of thousands of dollars scouting. And then there was another, and the one, there's this other guy who has nothing to do with any of this. He's like, you know, Billy backcountry, like me and you super DIY, just a regular Joe. And he'd been, he'd had cam picks of this bull and he'd been chasing the bull and chasing the bull and chasing the bull, but he couldn't shoot it because it wasn't season yet. And this bull had this habit He'd be visible until a certain day. And then right before the seasons changed, he would like disappear off into this unit and no one would see him for the rest of the year. But because this Jimmy John's guy had this tag and I guess basically this guy gets a call. A three is up there with the Armada, like 40 dudes and Jimmy John's coming in on a helicopter. And so he runs up there ready to just, you know, he's like, I'm waking up in the morning. I'm going to walk in straight through the middle of the Valley. Like, fuck you. Like I worked way too hard for this. I don't care how much money you have. If I don't get them, no one gets them. <laughs> and then uh, Ryan, that DC Outfitters guy, I don't remember all the details, but, and it was this guy telling a story. He basically pulls like just this super good guy move and basically goes up to the guy, finds him in his tent at night and says to him like, listen, man, it's this bullshit. I get it but it's also kind of what's going to happen. And this is the way this goes down. How do we make this right with you? And I think the guy got like a full replica mount. I don't know if cash changed hands. And he said, listen, I want you to get up in the morning. You come with us, sit on the Hill, film anything you want. Like we want you to be a a part of it, but he's going to take the shot one way or another. And you know, and you know, and I know you don't want to be the guy walking through and, and being an asshole. And he was able to like bring the whole thing around, but it was just one of those, like nothing like that happens in Canada. Like maybe like they scout pretty hard for sheep. Like I, I have some very good friends who are sheep guides and they'll send four or five guys out for two weeks to ride around on horses and just kind of like get the lay of the land. But there's very little of this, like, like the, this, this like army of guides that like know every single animal on the hill, have hundreds of pictures, two, three years of sheds. They're all cataloged. And then it's all about getting this one dude with a shitload of money, this like crazy fucking. But even at the end of the day, if that guy's paying Arizona or whatever the state is, two, 300 grand for a tag and that money's going to conservation and it's just one less elk on the hill. I also kind of don't give a shit. Like I'm, I'm totally behind those big auction tags. Like I think those are a great idea. It's one animal and it generates an insane amount of money for conservation. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of in the same boat with you, dude. At first I was kind of like, Oh, that's lame. And yeah, you know, it, it is like, you see all the big giant deer in the pictures and 90 plus percent of those are the ones that or basically bought, but Hey, yeah. it's good. It's good for hunting. It gets other people excited. It gives money to that state. It can be good. You know I mean? But like you kind of mentioned, dude, there's just something about, I think I've only been able three or four of my deer. I've been able to like find them, scout them preseason, and then actually like get that particular deer killed. And there's just nothing like that, dude. Even if it's not a big one, it's just so cool having a deer that you named and found and know where he lives, dude. One, one of my favorite one of my favorite books up here, this one right in the middle. I don't know if you can see him. Yeah, yeah. 135 inch crabby old four point. He, uh, he, uh, lab aged, Robbie Denning lab aged him at eight and a half years old. Um, ain't a, ain't a big deer score wise, but like, you know, huge body, just a heavy horned buck. Um, I found him out shed hunting in, uh, March, like actually like the end of March. He should have by all means like had his horns dropped already. Yeah. And, uh, I found him and uh, killed him within a quarter mile. I went out and scouted and he had like just basically lived in this tiny little box and even finding him and finding that little box and stuff and finding where he was in archery and velvet. It was like, he was not more, like I said, more than a quarter mile. But if I didn't already know exactly where he was living, 
come rifle season in October after he shed that velvet, I'd have never found that deer. He was in the yeah. thick, nastiest north slope on the other side, you know. It was a big knife ridge. It was at the south face is open. The north face is just thick as shit with the uh, scrub oak. And, uh, yeah, you would have never found him after he shed his velvet, dude. But, like, just being able to be on top of him like that, man, there's, there's nothing. There's no better feeling when you kill that deer. No, and that. that goes back to what we were talking about earlier about something about the like there's different levels of achievement in this. And like I will be the first one to admit that plenty of my kills were just like dumb luck and not giving up. Like the elk I got this year with my bow solo. I didn't it was not because I was a smart guy. You know what I mean? Like it yeah. was because I was a guy who just didn't stop walking through the woods. And I just walked across an elk in a, in a wallow. Like, yeah, there was some like, like I was, I chose the path and I'll, I will take like a little bit of credit, but like that was a lucky kill. And I'm, I will, t- I have no problem taking a, a lucky kill, but there's been a couple kills in my life where it was like premeditated, planned out. And there's, there's nothing like it. Cause it's like, there's no luck in this motherfucker. Do you know what there, I mean? Like, uh, yeah. Yeah. I've got a few of those too, dude. One of my favorite archery bucks was like that. I literally, I mean, I came up with a bitching game plan and I went up some ridge that nobody had ever gone up and yada, yada. But realistically, I was kind of Elmer fudding it with a bow. You know, I was looking up this ridge and I happened, I was planning on glassing this stuff to the right. And I got up the ridge and started following these tracks. And I'm like, hmm, you know, these are big buck tracks. Like, you know, literally like this was like all the little podcast shit clicking and stuff. And I'm like, dude, these fresh big buck tracks like and i start following them and we walked up, up right on this deer in his bed like and fucking just smoked him dude <laughs> you know 44 yards and it was it was still he had a big double eye guard on one side he's, he's like a four by three but he's just heavy and cool and he's one of my favorite bucks you know and i've had a couple that were lucky like that in fact my chick always gives me shit because she thinks i'm just so lucky and but you know there is there is some a little bit of luck involved sometimes, but for the most part, you kind of make your own luck, you know? I think it's grinding too. Like I've always said, my biggest asset as a hunter is that I just don't stop. Like the amount yeah. of like late in the hunt kills I've had. And yeah, it was luck. But if I hadn't have decided to keep walking and keep looking, they wouldn't have happened. And that's what kind of one of my biggest messages to people is like, you don't got to be good at this. You just got to not quit. And eventually you're going to kill something because it's just like the law of averages. There's only so many square miles out there and there's so many animals. And if you cover enough of them, you're going to come across one. And that's not the most efficient way to go hunting, but (laughs) I mean, it's a tool in your toolkit that like just grinding, you know what I mean? It is dude. I mean, it's a combination of just, you know, grinding it out and having the time to do it. You know, I mean, all the people that don't kill anything for the most part, that that's what they all have in common is that they just don't yeah. spend enough days out there. And 90% of them will give you the excuse of their job or their kids or their wife and everything else. And it's like, I'm sorry, dude, but like, you need to change that. If you want to be successful, yeah. if you really love hunting and you want to be good at it, you need more days in the field, flat 100%, out. 100%, man. I, can, just, I can't say that enough. And it's yeah. like, just prioritize it. Like people are always like, I don't even know how many days I spent hunting last year. It's scary. Um, <laughs> but it's like, it's because of what I want to do. So it's like, I wake up in the morning and it's like, what do I have to do in my life today so that when the summer hits, uh, you know, I can be gone for two weeks, come home for two weeks, leave for another two weeks. And like, business is going to be okay. Finances are going to be okay. Wife and kid are going to be okay. Like if you want it bad enough, you will figure out a way to, to get it done. Yeah, exactly, dude. Exactly. You know, and sometimes it does cost you a little money. I mean, dude, I, yep. I could probably own another house and have a nicer truck and, and a lot of other things if I didn't give up so much time that I, yep. I want to spend in the hills or, you know, but Hey, I, I wouldn't trade it right now. I'll tell you that much. No, it was funny when I was in my mid thirties, I was like the 10 mil in the guy, the bank kind of guy. Like that was my intrinsic motivation. I wanted legit fuck you money. Um, (laughs) and now that I'm in my forties, I kind of don't care. Like I've made it to a spot in life where things are comfortable enough. House is nice. Wife's hot. (laughs) Go on vacation when we want. Like life's good, man. I don't, if there was another couple zeros in the bank, I don't think it would functionally change anything in my life, but now I recognize I only got so many days left 
to do all this stuff. And so now it's like, it's not about how much money I got in the bank. It's about how many hours during the day do I get to spend doing the shit I love? And how many hours do I need to spend doing the shit I hate in order to make the rest happen? And how can I every day start shifting that ratio? So there's like more hours in the day I love and less hours in the day I hate. And I feel like I'm I'm as close to that at now as I've ever been. Like I'm closer to getting that ratio all the way over now than I ever have been before. But it's taken me a lifetime to, to figure that all out. You know what I mean? Hey, well, you probably have a couple extra zeros than I do. I've, I've actually kind of lived by that for a long time. And, you know, for good or for bad, I, I love my life and, I, and I'm happy. But, you know, it's funny because, like I told you, I work about, eight months of the year on the boat and I get about four months off. And, um, you know, I have been working this last year or so doing the nutrition coaching and, and that's actually getting pretty good. So it's a nice way to supplement my winter, yeah. but um, you wouldn't believe how many stupid comments I get and messages I get like from people online that are like, cause they see me out coyote hunting in the mornings and stuff. And they're like, Oh, must be nice. You don't work. Da, da, da. Don't you have a job? And it's just like, you want to just tell once in a while I will too. I'll be like, motherfucker, you know how many hours I work in the summer yeah. and fall? Probably more than you work the whole year, dude. Like it all adds up the same. It breaks down the same. I work a lot of hours, man. So chill out. But most of them, I just laugh and don't say anything, but yeah. it's just, it's like, Hey dude, if you're, I have told a bunch of them too. I go, man, if you're not happy with your life, dude, change it, figure out a different job. You know, yeah. huh? what, what do you got to do? Listen, man, this has been badass. I'm kind of kind of on me that it took so long to get this one kind of organized. You just mentioned the nutri- nutrition coaching. So let's let's wrap this up. Are you still taking on new clients? Are you fully up? Like, what's the deal? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really been advertising it a lot because, you know, I just, I've been slowly growing it and don't want to get too many guys. I just got yep. another app all sorted out so I can handle more guys and stuff. So yeah, I'm doing that and I'm going to continue to do that. The boat... In the past, we didn't have Wi-Fi on some of the boats that I worked on. So now okay. we have full Wi-Fi so I can communicate with all my guys and everything while I'm out at sea too. So that would be huge. So yeah. Okay. So if anybody's listening, I'm going to put Ryan's um, Instagram in the show notes. Do you want to spell it out for people just in case they're too lazy to look? Yeah, it's uh, A-R-R-R underscore block or okay. Ryan Block is my name. Perfect. Um, Pirate. And I, I don't give recommendations loosely, but you're one dude. I Because I have people ask me and I was going to start doing it. And then I just kind of did this cost benefit analysis. And I'm like, with the other stuff I'm trying to build right now, I simply don't have the time. So for anybody who's followed me and you're kind of interested in the same stuff that I'm into, and that's why you were contacting me, I think Ryan would be a great guy because it's a good combination of like, common sense nutritional advice. He's going to empower you with some tools so that you, you're not just like a robot following instructions. You're going to understand what you're, what you're doing. And it's like, listen, you can be healthy and still look good with your shirt off. Like it's okay to say, I, I want to look good. You know what I mean? Like that's a, that's an acceptable goal. And I think some people feel like that's maybe not okay. So I, I appreciate when people uh, you know, openly prioritize both. Like we can, we can be healthy and still look good. Yeah, man. Yeah. I'm just helping guys speed up the learning curve. Basically, you know, it's not, it's not as hard as most people think, you know, I'm sure you've heard a million times, all the guys, all your friends that are like, all right, I'm going on a diet, vegetables and chicken. And it's like, no dude, that's not, that's just a recipe to fall off in two weeks, man. That ain't how you do it. Like, so more just teaching guys how to manage and a sustainable like year round approach, man. You know? Yeah. No, that's not, badass. Not a cookie cutter, copy paste, eat this. That doesn't teach you that. That's okay if you can follow that for a few months, but nobody's going to stick with that. That's not sustainable. That's what I'm on right now for prep. And I try and tell people like, listen, I can do this for nine, 10, 12 weeks because I'm a fucking robot. But yeah. like, A, you don't want to. Like there's nothing about this that you want. And- 99% of people in the world have no need to get into contest shape. Yes. And to get into contest shape, you got to do some dumb shit. But for the rest of the world, that's just looking to lose that 15 or 20 pounds or get up the hill a little bit faster. I, I love watching your and your ladies stories, man. It's like, you know, the creative breakfasts and like working the protein into the oats and like, uh, you know, 
all the pancakes and like like it it, it looks like food you want to eat. You know what I mean? And and it still fits the macros that you're setting out for yourself. Yeah, man. Yeah, for sure. Yep. I appreciate that, dude. I appreciate you. You know, giving me the heads up on that. It's it's good feedback. I just you know it's been pretty rewarding to help people, man. In this in this last year, I mean, I've I've been into fitness and nutrition my whole life. And I've only been a nutrition coach for like the last year, but it's been pretty awesome, man. I've been able to help a lot of guys. A lot of guys um, are just right at that, you know, right around 40 age or whatever, you know, younger, older, what it doesn't matter. But a lot of guys that are really overweight that have finally decided to make a change, dude. And it's going to change their life, dude. If you're at that, you know, 250, 300 pound mark, dude, at 40, it's going to go one way or the other. You're only going to either just, get fatter or you're going to get in shape and your heart, your knees, your back, your kids, everybody's going to thank you if you decide to go that one way, man. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, brother. Well, thank you for, for taking the time and, um, I'm sure we'll chat again soon. Thank you, Jay. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers, man.